Hi, it's Dwyer. Dwyercrime.blog. Also, keepingitfree.blogspot.com. Today is February 20th, 2023. Let's talk about the curious case of Melissa Lucio. What I want you to do as you listen to these facts is to ask yourself whether this case was fairly prosecuted. Because I need for people to understand that Melissa Lucio is on death row in the state of Texas right now. Right? If you're listening to the facts and you're asking yourself whether there's enough evidence to even go forward with the criminal prosecution, just understand that one already happened and this woman is now on death row. Let's talk about it. <clears throat> Imagine you're sitting in a room in a very stressful situation in which you're being questioned by police about the death of a loved one your child. Now, <clears throat> before we go further, let's ask a couple of questions. I just want you to privately think for yourself what your personal answer is. How long could you go without food or water? Right? Your two-year-old daughter has died, you're being questioned by the police, how long could you go without food or water? Now imagine that you have asserted your innocence more than not 10 times, not 20 times, but imagine you, during the conversation, have asserted your innocence more than 100 times. It's been that repetitive. The questioning. Does that shorten the period in which you could go without food or water? If the answer is yes, by how much would that shorten the time? Now imagine that in addition to you having a history as being a victim of sexual abuse as a child, starting at age seven, as well as having had a drug abuse history, problems with cocaine in the past. And of course, you're the mother of not three, not five, not eight, but 12 kids. Would any of that have an impact of the amount of time under these stressful conditions where the police are repetitively asking you the same questions, would that impact the time you could go without food or water? By how much would that shorten the time? Now let's add a whole new wrinkle. You are pregnant with twins. How long could you go without food or water? The Texas police questioned a pregnant Melissa Lucio for seven hours without providing her water. After more than a hundred denials concerning the death of her two-year-old child, which Miss Lucio contends happened two days after the child fell down a flight of stairs. Melissa Lucio said, I guess I did it. I'm responsible. Right, folks, that's the confession. I guess I did it. I'm responsible. What weight would you give this confession by a pregnant woman after seven hours of extremely 
repetitive questioning. In my opinion, it should be very little. I question whether the prosecution's theory of the case is correct. I don't believe Melissa Lucio should have gotten the death penalty, as the evidence to me is deficient. Now, the state of Texas contends that Melissa abused her two-year-old child, Mariah Alvarez, over a period of time, and that the long-term abuse led to the child's death. It is not disputed that at the time of her death, young Mariah had scattered bruising in various stages of healing, as well as injuries to her head and contusions of the kidneys, lungs, and spinal cord. The prosecution, remember, they're the state of Texas, further contends that the child had bite marks on her back, patches of hair that had been pulled out, and a broken arm. These claims are based on the medical examiner's report. The medical examiner believed that Mariah's broken arm was caused two to seven weeks before her death. Now that's the state's story. The defense has a different story. The defense contends that the child fell down a flight of stairs two days earlier and appeared fine. The fall caused the bruising according to the defense. Her mother, Melissa, did not realize that her daughter was badly hurt. Her death, two days later, was unexpected. Now, the defense also argues that a blood coagulation disorder can result in severe bruising and that a fractured arm is not uncommon in toddlers particularly those with a history of falls. Now, is this a case of child neglect and parental incompetence? Let's remember the defendant had many kids to care for and may have lost sight of an individual child's injuries. Is this case one of parental child abuse? A parent breaking a child's arm, refusing to have the child medically examined, beating the child so that bruises formed over time? Or, and we need to consider this, because understand, it's the state that has the burden of proof to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt? Or is this case one of a terrible accident? A child falling down a flight of stairs two days earlier and the extent of the injuries not being fully appreciated by the child's overextended mother. I personally don't believe Guilt for murder can be determined beyond a reasonable doubt here. Let's talk about why. The alleged confession is unconvincing to me. I don't give it any weight. If the police had a strong case and did not need a confession, they would have allowed a pregnant defendant to get water during the first seven hours of interrogation. Let me also add other reasons. The medical testimony is less than conclusive. Yes, the child had bruising, 
Well, she would have had bruising from a fall. The timing of the bruising is hard to determine. In big families with a lot of kids, the cause of the bruising is uncertain. Another kid or kids could have contributed to the bruising. The existence of bruising by itself does not establish that the child's mother caused the bruising. Let me also say too, the claim that the two-year-old had a bite mark on her back is also too subjective. An expert is interpreting the series of bruising. Now understand, the prosecution did not match the bruising to anyone's teeth. Let me repeat that. This is not the Ted Bundy case. In this case, we're hearing of a bite mark, but yet we can't match the bruising to the defendant's teeth. It is unclear if the bruising were bite marks. It's also unclear whether the bruising was caused by the defendant. <clears throat> Let's also talk about clearly questionable evidence. Let me point out here too, that we all wanna fight child abuse. I'm not here trying to support child abuse in any way, shape, or form. I have no doubt in my mind that the investigators here thought they had a child abuser in front of them and reached conclusions based on that belief, right? But just understand, some of the evidence here, looking at the file, is clearly questionable. A Texas Ranger, and I understand, Texas Rangers are exalted law enforcement professionals. A Texas Ranger who questioned Miss Lucio claimed he knew she was guilty based on her body language. In my opinion, this is junk science that should never have been presented to the jury. In my eyes, the fact that it was presented to the jury underscores how weak and unconvincing the evidence against Miss Lucio was. The, forens the forensic pathologist who determined that Mariah died due to blunt force trauma was advised that the defendant, Melissa Lucio, had confessed. This was before the pathologist came up with their finding. So that finding, in my opinion, is tainted by materially false information. Right. Let me also say, too, that the jury then would be left with reason to speculate as to what the finding would have been had the forensic pathologist been provided with accurate information. But the coup de grace in this case, as bad as it is, right, not offering water to a pregnant woman for the first seven hours of interrogation. Providing the forensic pathologist with false information, false information before that pathologist renders their findings, as bad as that is, right? Bite marks that don't correspond to anyone's teeth. The coup de grace here is the suppressed evidence. That evidence included information from Child Protective Services who interviewed the defendant's other children that the kids actually corroborated Mariah's fall and her deteriorating health and that the kids did not believe 
the allegations of abuse by their mother. Further, according to CNN, authorities knew there were witnesses who said Lucio did not abuse her children. There were other family members who were aware that Mariah fell down the stairs and that Mariah had not shown any sign that her arm was injured in the weeks before her death. In other words, the people around the situation, and I understand, some of them might be biased, right? Family members who were around the kids might love Melissa Lucio, might not want her to go to jail, right? They presented evidence that the child didn't have a bad arm. No one around the child thought that the child had a broken arm. Also, the other kids, and I understand these cases are highly sensitive, right? Parents will pressure kids to come up with a favorable version of events. But understand, here you have many kids. She's the mother of 12, folks. You have many kids. And the kids support mom's version of events. Right? People knew about the fall before the child died. So, those witnesses, in my opinion, any witnesses who say Mariah fell or who saw her during the period of time that the prosecution says her arm was broken and who did not notice anything wrong would greatly hurt the prosecution's case. Now, for me, the fact that this evidence wasn't fully disclosed is simply outrageous. And so, again, the burden should be with the prosecution. When you hear that a pregnant woman, she's pregnant with twins, hasn't had access to water for seven hours, has denied the claims a hundred times before she supposedly confesses, when the confession is as mild as possible, and when the experts have been fed wrong information, and when the people around the child did not see anything wrong with the child's arms, and when the child's siblings say that the child fell down the flight of stairs, the question for me isn't whether Melissa Lucio should have been convicted of murder and placed on death row, which is what happened. The question for me is whether the prosecution even has enough evidence to pursue this at trial. Right, folks, the forensic pathologist, that's useless. Right? If I'm a forensic pathologist and I'm preparing a report, then they come in and tell me that the defendant confessed and all this other stuff, that's, that's going to greatly impact my findings. I'm going to believe that there's no question of fact as to culpability. Let me also say, too, I know that some defendants try to act tough, deny the claims, the police eventually get a confession. Folks, the confession is only as good as the circumstances under which it was given. Right here you have a mother who's there for seven hours. That's ineffective policing. Quite frankly, that's not the kind of policing that we as a society should support. So I encourage people to research this case. I consider it to be outrageous, right? The defendant's name is Melissa Lucio. She right now is on death row in Texas.
In my opinion, it's an outrage. Let me hear from you. If you feel that there are facts I've glossed over, and I'll agree that this is a inflammatory case that involves child abuse allegations, let us know about it in the comment section of this YouTube video. You can find this um, on a audio podcast at thewirecrime.blog. It's also available on Apple Podcasts as well as Amazon and Spotify. I hope you give the podcast series a look. Thanks for stopping by.